Good evening. Welcome to the Museum of Modern Art. My name is Pablo Elguera, and I am the Director of Adult and Academic Programs here in the Education Department at MoMA. It's a great pleasure uh, to welcome you to the second program of our One Work Conversation Series. For those of you who are watching this program on our live stream, uh, I want to welcome you as well. As part of our efforts to celebrate the reopening of MoMA and its reimagined galleries, this conversation series has been established to introduce and reintroduce the public to key specific works in the collection by hearing directly from the artist about its making, the set of concerns that informed it, and its place within the artist's career and trajectory. Tonight, we are delighted to welcome Dayanita Singh, who will speak about her work, Museum of Chance, who is now, which is now on view as part of our Surrounds exhibition. Singh's work reflects and expands on the ways in which people relate to photographic imagery. Her recent works, drawn from her extensive photographic oeuvre, are a series of mobile museums that allow her images to be endlessly edited, sequenced, archived, and displayed. Stemming from her interest in the archive, um, the museums present her photographs as interconnected bodies of work that are full of both poetic and narrative possibilities. Publishing is also a significant part of Singh's practice. She has created multiple book objects, works that are concurrently books, art objects, exhibitions, catalogs, often with the publisher Steidl. Museum Baban has been shown at the Hayward Gallery in London, the Museum for Good Modern Kunst in Frankfurt, the Art Institute of Chicago, and the Kieran Nadar Museum in New Delhi. Singh was awarded the Prince Klaus Award in 2008, and in 2013, she became the first artist from India to have also a solo exhibition at London's Hayward Gallery. The format of this one work series is very specific. The program is set for one hour, consisting in a conversation and a set of questions for the artist. Toward the end of the program, we will turn it over for questions from the audience, so please do think of questions you may want to ask. At the end of the program, you all are invited to go upstairs to experience the work in person if you haven't had a chance to do so. Last but not least, because this is a new program series, we are looking for visitor feedback. So we would appreciate it if, as you exit the auditorium, you can fill a small form. Uh, I am very grateful to Lucy Gallon, Associate Curator in the Department of Photography, who has graciously agreed to moderate tonight's conversation. And now, without any further ado, please help me in welcoming Dayanita Singh and Lucy Gallon. Thank you so much uh, to Pablo for that welcome, and thank you to Pablo and the whole team um, in education for coordinating this talk. It is so exciting, such a treat for all of us. Um, I would also like to thank the Department of Photography um, for everything around this uh, acquisition and uh, this work in our collection, as well as the Contemporary Arts Council, the Modern Women's Fund, and our Committee on Photography, who supported the acquisition of this work into the museum's collection. And most of all, Dianita, it's just wonderful to be in conversation with you in every way, uh, personal conversation and public conversation, and I'm so excited that we can continue it right now. Um, so we're seeing behind us, as you can see, the work that we're talking about, the Museum of Chance, and you can tell right away that it consists of multiple parts. Um, there are large structures that house images. There are boxes of images on the walls, installed on the walls, and there is a table and stools set up there in the middle of the room. And all of these, uh, structures make up what Dianita calls the Museum of Chance, which is one of several museums that you developed in 2013. What does a museum or one of these museums consist of? A museum is an architecture for things 
that somebody thinks are valuable, that somebody wants to look after. So it needs an architecture and it needs a collection and it needs a reserve collection and a display collection so that things can keep changing and it needs a catalog and it needs a gift shop. I didn't get to the gift shop, but this could turn into a gift shop at the end of the evening. Um, so, so I, was, I was very keen to make my own idea of the museum because I love, love the concept of museums, but I often felt intimidated or stupid or sort of felt quite sterile in a museum, and yet I wanted to go there, so I thought I should maybe make my own museums. And that's what I did and made eight of them, and then Museum of Chance, which is the models that I brought to show you how it operates. Basically, the museums should be, like, I should be able to change them, change the display, of course, but also change the space in, in a minute or less than a minute. And so then I can make conversations between the different parts of the museum. I can open and close them, as you saw in the video. Um, I can make them go away and have li the little boxes that are inside on the wall. So just use the architecture of the museum in a way that museums never allowed me to work with my photographs. And I think possibly my concern with the museums and is, is very fo to do with photography because I felt the, the museum and the gallery, the institutions limited what I could do with photography. And I knew that there is a lot more to photography. My experience was not just of images on the wall. So somewhere with all those concerns, these museums were born and Chance was the last one. You've also talked about how you were printing gelatin silver prints and these were displayed on the wall. And at that moment, you had been using a digital camera and, print and shooting digital and were no longer printing due to the paper uh, availability. And That's so that true. allowed yeah. this form or encouraged this form. Yeah, absolutely. While I was making silver prints, I never thought about... Uh, the print was sacrosanct. It had to be, it had to be perfect. The conditions for its storage had to be perfect. The framing had to be perfect. And I loved the materiality of the silver gelatine print. But when they stopped making that beautiful forte paper, and I didn't like the Ilford paper, I thought maybe I have to try digital prints. But once I tried digital prints, I could dare to dream of making a museum bhavan, which would have. 900 images in it. Otherwise, I don't know if I, how many years it would have taken me to print 900 silver uh, images. So just going to digital actually freed me. I went to it out of a great sense of despair and thought, how am I going to photograph and actually ended up doing something that I could never have imagined with silver. And so the prints that are on view um, in the work on the sixth floor are inkjet prints, archival inkjet prints, actually the same uh, for process and material as what you're holding right now in your hand in a different yeah. size. <laughs> um, so this idea that these were no longer um, the same gelatin silver objects, but the same images that were now being resequenced um, within the structures and in the boxes on the wall. Yes. So these, <laughs> what are those, by the way? Well, after I came to MoMA last time, um, I thought it might be a little confusing for curators to know how the many ways in which you can open and close the museum. And you know, it could just become a complete straight line and you could just have a wall of images if you wanted, or you could have structures like that or you could turn these and you would still be able to see all the images. And then if MoMA decided that they wanted to show Museum of Chance on the street, they could do that because nobody could really then go inside the museum. So I had thought of that configuration as well. 
And I thought rather than explain this with drawings, it would be easier if I just brought a model for, uh, for you to have in your storage. And then I thought I must bring all the little prints because, you know, uh, firstly, you never know when you might want to make a museum. So in the course of the conversation, I might have an idea. Like upstairs, I was looking at uh, one of the panels and I said, oh my God, there's a museum of legs here. So now I immediately want to take out the images of the legs and make that museum when we go up. So this just is like a tool for the, for you, Lucy, the, the prints and the, and the model. And so these are going to go into your department. Thank you also for, for offering a tool to me, but it, that reminds me of my role in a way. Um, now that MoMA has acquired this work, it has entered our collection, curators are working with it, the registrar has um, you know, worked on making sure it is stored properly and it's cataloged in our collection. And I noticed also that your um, old role as the director has changed as well. I s <laughs> well, if I may, I wanted to take this opportunity to thank the director of Museum of Modern Art um, for giving Museum of Chance the finest home it could ever have. And I thank you, uh, dear director, on behalf of the trustees of Museum Pavan <laughs> and as the ex-director of Museum, <laughs> Museum of Chance. And thank you so much. And thank you also, uh, Mr. Director, for really, really, it's as though you had X-ray eyes with which you read the museum and all that I was trying to do with it. I, 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 should, say, I should say that at the end of showing it, showing these museums for about five or six years, I was quite disheartened because everybody looked at the photographs. And it's not my problem that I make good photographs. You know, that's sort of <laughs> a given now. But it doesn't help me very much if your conversation doesn't go beyond that. So I almost thought these photographs are becoming my enemy. But I don't know how to make wishy-washy photographs. So I even, at the end of a showing in Delhi showed the entire museum without any of the images to say, let's talk about what I'm trying to critique here. Let's talk about the kind of space I want in the museum for photography. And I didn't get that. And so when, when I came last month for the opening, I was not prepared for the talk that the director made about Museum of Chance. And for those of you who were there, you may have noticed I was standing on the side and was quite overwhelmed, shall we say. Um, so, Mr. Director, thank you so much. And I now will step aside and give you full charge and full control of the museum. Though when I was in, in my time, I had to be the registrar and the curator and the director. And actually that, um, well, I'm gonna, we'll come back to that, but I wanted to also mention this other uh, important aspect of your museums is that they're not just places for storage and for display, but also places where programming happens. Yes. Yeah, I mean, and, that is the most important, the conversation. And here we're seeing, just to show you, the museum has traveled around the world. So <laughs> now here it is in New York on our sixth floor, but it's been in Mumbai and London and Delhi. And there, here you see some of the conversations that we've been having on the sixth floor using the table and stools that you've incorporated as part of the museum. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that aspect, that conversational aspect as a museum of place for such a thing? Yeah, I think people tend to think of museums as places for contemplation, and of course it's all of that. But it, it, it also needs to be a place for conversation. So, and the conversation doesn't happen on benches, uh, because you're sitting side by side. I feel the conversation needs a table. And I've spent a lot of time working out what that distance should be. But the problem was that while I was making the earlier museums, curators always said, you know, it's, 
it's expensive enough for us to ship your museums. So now if you expect us to make another crate with all your uh, tables and stools, that's a bit much. And so that's when I thought, ah, so I have to get a space within my museum. And so when you go upstairs, you'll see in this section is where I hid the tables and the stools so that there was no way that a museum could say, no, 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 we can't have uh, your furniture. And if I had my way, I would put those tables and stools all over the museum because I would encourage people to come to my museum or my ex-museum, um, you know, to have an interview, to make a proposal, to break a relationship, to anything, whatever, to just come and do some reading, but just invite people to come and occupy the museum and to have these conversations that happen there. And then there's bound to be a different relationship to the work. Otherwise, you know how it is with photography exhibitions. People just come and have this glazed look and they think they've got it. And that's, that's so disheartening. And it's because of all the prints on the wall. And I know that, you know, it happened in 1929 and that's what Stieglitz wanted. But now it's 2019. And we still show photography like that. And I feel I want more from photography. And I need it to be more tactile. And that's why I love the book so much. And in fact, this museum allows for multiple forms because there's the place for having these conversations, bringing out the books, talking about the possibilities for existing within the structures and um, being in an enclosed space or also for making these boring um, constellations of, of prints on the wall that could live for a time on the wall. They could be installed, and on the left is one of the groupings that's installed there now, and they're there on the wall together. This is a mini museum of gestures. But on the right was a more impromptu museum, and I understand that um, this museum came out when you invited a curator, our colleague Shane Javeri, um, to make a museum that was possible within the Museum of Chance. And that's another thing that's possible in this museum. At the beginning, the video that we included um, mentioned that this was your mother museum. You had said you had made eight museums um, before you came to this one. And this museum also can birth many other museums. Can you talk about what you mean by that and those possibilities as you imagine them? You know, I wrote it down because it's easier to just, yeah, it's better if I just read what I had written for, this was for Museum Bhavan while it was, it was the guide at the Kiranadar Museum. So I'm talking about Museum Bhavan, and I'm, which has these nine museums. The internal relationships among, among them have evolved through the endless process of editing, sequencing, and archiving that su sustains the formal thinking essential to the realization of my work. So within the extended family of Museum Bhavan, it is now becoming clear that File Museum and Museum of Little Ladies are sibling museums, while Museum of Photography and Museum of Furniture are cousins, Museums also give birth to other museums. Museum of Embraces came out of Museum of Chance, but turned out to be somewhat premature and was returned into Chance. Museum of Vitrines emerged from Museum of Furniture quite by chance during the unpacking at the previous venue. It is possible that there is a Museum of Glass lurking somewhere within the Museum of Chance. It remains to be seen when it will be delivered. <laughs> and then when you see all the museums together, there are characters like, you know, Mona, Zakir, that show up in different museums. My young friend, Ohuna, who I've been photographing since the age of two, is very much there in the Museum of Little Ladies, but she's also there sprawled on the bed with her mother in Museum of Chance. And then I'm sure in Museum of Photography, there's a connection as well. So, Showing all the museums together was great. And, but after making all of these museums, I thought, why am I still following the way 
museums think of museums, you know, Museum of Photography, Museum of Furniture, even though Museum of Photography is not quite what you think it is. But I'll wait for it to be shown for you to realize that. But Museum of Chance is where I really feel I realized the museum as what I would like the museum to be. And then when I come to the new MoMA, I find that's what is going on here. That's what I love about the new MoMA, that things are changing, that I'm not being shown things in one perspective. And that has made, that empowers me. And so I can walk into a room and say, hmm, I'm not sure if that works with a Picasso or whether that would have been better in the surrealism room. So suddenly I'm walking in the same museum that I walked in for 20 years at least. No, no longer. I was studying here in 89. But suddenly I have a different relationship to the museum. Clearly Something really we learned changed. from artists like you. Yeah, I think. <laughs> no, but um, after you had these museums had started going out into the world, you've talked about that feeling of what it was like when you had Museum of Chance um, in your possession and you were thinking of the possible mini museums that it could birth, that was one relationship you had to it. And then it came here and it's now in our collection. And um, so I, I wondered, we've talked a little bit about the backstory and the making of the museum, but then what happened next after um, Museum of Chance came here? And actually just before that, after you had made the museum, I think you thought a little bit about how it could exist and how it might get out there to others. Yeah, you see, the museums were never meant to be acquired by anybody. Uh, I never thought anybody would want them, so I just made them at the height that would come back into my apartment, which is eight feet, so no museum could be higher than eight feet, because I was going to be Museum Bhavan. My house was going to be Museum Bhavan, but then the museums got acquired, um, except for chance. And so I started to feel what's going to happen to the museums now. And then I wanted to make sure that people could engage with the Museum of Chance, even though it was in my house, because Museum of Chance was not available for anyone to acquire. So Museum of Chance remained in my house. And then I made a book where I asked uh, Steidl if he would make me a book which had 88 different covers because I thought then I could make structures out of them that could make them, that with which I could display them on the wall. That was an old obsession of mine, to get the print off the wall and put the book on the wall and yet be true to the book so that the book doesn't, it's not like I'm destroying the book in any way. And so God knows why, but Gerhard agreed to print me, to make me a book with 88 different covers and then I was the only one who had the full sets. So what that did was, if you wanted the cover with the two shirts hanging, you could definitely not get it on Amazon, and you would have to go to the bookshop, and repeatedly, because you may never see that cover. So there was this element of chance, and I wanted you to make an effort. And if you wanted to have the Onkavara image from Salegao, then you had to come to an event of mine because I was the only one who had the full set. So that was the book being disseminated and then I decided I wanted to travel with the books and have an exhibition suddenly. Like I shouldn't have to wait for an invitation and shipping and all that. And so I made this structure and that's the book, which is a regular Steidl, not Steidl doesn't make anything regular, but uh, <laughs> whatever you would call it, a mass-produced title book that I made these structures for, and that then goes into this case, and I can... I used to be able to carry it quite easily, now it seems a little heavy. So this was... And then I made, out of these same structures, I made a suitcase museum, so that in two suitcases, I could have 44 books that meant the whole set of 88 images, front and back, were available for people uh, to see. And then the Sydney Biennale said they would like to show my work. And I said, well, if you want to show my work, you have to show the suitcase museum. 
And fortunately for me, Stephanie Rosenthal was the curator, and she was the curator at the Hayward. So it worked. So I used to, I sort of had to force my book works down people's throats. And it was like, if you want me, you get my book, you get my book cart, you get my bookcase. Even for this talk, I said, I'm coming, but I'm going to bring the bookcase, I'm going to bring the model. And I had to stop short of saying, I'm going to bring the book cart, which is also made of that 158 centimeter size so that it can fit into uh, the luggage. Oh, poor us. We <laughs> have to endure this. <laughs> But and then, then, yeah, after this was before um, MoMA had acquired the work, yeah. you had made the book object and Museum of Chance book. And then, as I said, Museum of Chance was never meant to be acquired. It was meant to be offered to a museum after I died, whenever I died. Um, but, but then just to sort of make it uh, not to be too rude to the gallerist who I love very much, I said... She said, are you absolutely sure? And I said, absolutely sure. This museum sh cannot be acquired because it has all my creativity in it. And all there are so many museums. It's pregnant with so many museums. I cannot give it to anyone. And she said, absolutely sure. And I said, yes, absolutely sure. Unless, of course, it's a MoMA. And guess what happened? Two months later, nothing to do with the gallerist. It was just chance that the Museum of Modern Art, Lucy, in fact, called to say what is the status of Museum of Chance. So, of course, I was beside myself. And when she called to confirm, I didn't even believe her. And I told my mother, this is some prank call. One of my colleagues is trying to pull me down. And all of my mother, of course, said, you know, it could be true. And I said, I don't think the Museum of Modern Art would want my Museum of Chance. Um, but they did. And it was amazing. But it was only amazing for about two months after I told everybody and celebrated. And, and then I said, storage. That's what's going to happen. Museum of Chance is going to go into cold storage for 30 years. So possibly in my lifetime, I don't get to see this museum again. And that's when I went to Steidl and I said, you know, can you make me a miniature museum? So that me and my friends, it's very important that my friends be able to have my work. And I don't think of the Museum of Modern Art as my friend. <laughs> so I wanted my friends to have my work. And so we made this box, which had nine accordion fold books in it. It had the Godrej Museum, Museum of Men, Museum of Photography, Museum of Furniture, Little Ladies Museum, Museum of Machines, Museum of Vitrines, Printing Press Museum, ongoing museum, which was the new name for Museum of Chance. Because you see, I had already made the Museum of Chance book. So Steidl said, you can't repeat those images. And I said, no problem. I've got so many. I'll make another set. So I made another set of images and called it ongoing museum. And so it doesn't have any of the same. So this is the structure that we used, uh, this accordion fold, so that the book could be the exhibition. And that was very important to me, that the book be the exhibition. There was a great, there is a great curator who came to my studio to collect my work for her museum. And I said to her, you know, why are you bothering with buying my prints? You should just buy my books, because that is the heart of my work. And I wasn't making the museums at that time. And she said, that's all very well, Dianita. We would love to have your books, but you know, what do we do with them? We either make a facsimile, or we make a projection, or uh, they just lie in a vitrine, none of which you would like. And that's when I realized that the books have to be exhibitable. And I made center letter, and then I made Museum Bhavan when I was quite depressed after the MoMA acquisition, Euphoria ran off. <laughs> so we made this. And then here, too, I said to Steidl, OK, we're doing this. But everybody says a book doesn't have value because it's mass produced. But I know it has tremendous value. So can we make 3,000 different boxes? And then we get 3,000 unique boxes with the same book inside. So it's mass produced and unique at the same time. And so now tell me, you know, does this go into the bookshop because it's a book? Or does it go into the museum because it's a unique object? 
And this is your box. It's, it's, it's really especially beautiful. <laughs> uh, people keep asking for the yellow one, but they can't have it because there are 3,000 different boxes. Right. And it also goes home with everyone to their individual houses where they can live with them. That yeah. is a huge privilege for me, to be in your house, to have, an, to have my exhibition in your house is very different. You see, I don't want to be a book on your bookshelf. And neither do I want to be a print on your wall. I'm very interested in that in-between space. And so when I can have my exhibition in your house, and if you become a collector of my book objects, and over 10 years you have 10 book works of mine, you know, you have enough of a collection to make a museum out of them. And also an opportunity for all of us to live with the work in the same way that one experiences it when they come to the museum. Um, at this point, I think we will see if there are any questions from the audience. I hope after Pablo's urging, you have been thinking about your questions and there might be a couple waiting to be expressed. I will just change the display till then. <laughs> Don't be distracted by Dianita. Think hard about your questions. There's a question here on the left. Yep. It seems like you have quite a fixation on museums, and I wondered whether how they figured in your early history or as a child, were they something important to you? So my way of connecting with any place, just one minute, let me get the configuration right. My way of connecting with a place is to go and visit as many house museums as I can. And somehow in India, we have a certain propensity for house museums, whether it's a poli politician or a religious figure. Um, and you see amazing things in these spaces because there isn't, there isn't a single curator. It's just what sort of gets left behind. So shaving brush of Kamaraj or the ambassador car that MGR drove in. And I always, always was completely fascinated by museums, photographed them a lot. So I have a long, I really love museums, but I also therefore I think realized some of the things that were limiting in museums, and especially when I came to the very big art museums, I didn't like to read um, wall texts that I couldn't understand, you know? I didn't like to go to a museum to feel stupid. I didn't like to go to a museum to feel like I had to be, I had to look at something in one way, which is why I've sort of kept these extra days in New York just to spend time at the new MoMA to really sort of do my critique. And I have quite a critique coming up of where this photograph could have been and why couldn't. I went to the, uh, to the gentleman who's the curator of the Fluxus Room with my jacket, which has my life as a museum at the back. And I pulled out one of the books, all my museum pavan is in here. So I can, you know, you never know when you might want to show somebody a museum. And I went to him literally like that and said, why am I not in the Fluxus room? <laughs> and that's what I love about this museum. And I really hope it'll start a, a movement where museums will become more uh, not, not, so, not so precise, because it allows me then to have a conversation with the museum. It allows me to make my own mind up rather than being told, this is this ism, that ism. And you should know that, otherwise don't come back. There's also that personal um, connection that you had with the photographs, how they were in your home, that you've spoken oh, yeah. about a little bit as well, that they weren't just you know, things that would be framed on a wall, but how they, how they I lived. Mean, yes. You know, my mother would have gone crazy on these three tables because you can... She would cover every surface with glass and put prints underneath it. And then those prints could be rearranged. And so a photograph was never meant to be a fixed thing. Even when it went into an album, it had the corners so you could take it out, briefly come under the table. Photography was a tactile thing. You had shoe boxes full of photographs. 
uh, it was only when I became an artist that I realized how fixed photography is in the art world. And uh, that was not my idea of photography at all. And I understand conservation and all of that. But I think, I think photographers have to really think of other ways. You know, prints on the wall are fine, but it can't be the only way. And I'm surprised that we don't see a lot more of that. I hope we will. I hope. But ag again, again, coming back to the new MoMA, I love how photography has been placed in different rooms. So one, it makes the room that much more accessible for people who may not know uh, the rest of the room because it's it, a photograph is an inviting thing. Um, we love that too, actually. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, but the room with the early photography is just sublime with Cezanne on one side and Picasso mm -hmm. on the other side. I mean, I'm imagining that that's going to make sure that certain aspects of photo history are going to have to be rewritten because they will have to consider Cezanne and Picasso, no? Right. I mean, I'm thinking again of your structure of making a museum and including images from across your career. So again, uh, thinking say with your example of the 19th century photography room, there's not just one story yeah. around a photograph that's already been told, but it might change when it comes into conversations with other things. And that's what you've allowed with this kind of structure. So we haven't yet talked much about some of the individual images that make up um, the museum, and I've just brought some of them here today, but they do include um, pictures from across your entire career that you've then gone back to. There's 162 images in the whole work, but this is a picture of Zakir Hussain from your first book or the, around the time of your first book that was about Zakir. And so pictures like this come into new conversations with more recent works. Yes, I don't think you realize, but I've planted my retrospective in your museum. We lucked out. We got to, we got to host your retrospective multiple times whenever we bring out this this work. Um, are there other questions? I don't want to monopolize the questions. Yes. It seems you're almost making an effort. There's a mic coming. Sorry if you. Yes. It seems as if you're almost making an effort to. Um, have this have your images be seen in a less precious surrounding and setting, yet all the images we've seen, the Museum of Chance is displayed in a gallery in a precious space. Has it ever been presented in a public space outside somewhere? You haven't been listening or I haven't been speaking. <laughs> but I meant specifically the the large scale. It works at lots of different levels. So those same images are in this box, mm -hmm. in this book, that you can buy in the bookshop outside for, I think, $40. Uh, but it would be in a library as well. So no, everything has the other level to it as well. But the Museum of Chance, because of the way that I've made the structure for it, all the museums actually can close entirely. So they can be in a completely public space if one wants. But right now, I'm very happy to have them in the museum space because I want them to be a conversation that museums can then have while engaging with them. I'm hoping it throws up all kinds of questions about how, how much can you touch a work of art. But this work demands to be touched a lot. And in fact, the wood requires that it be touched, you know? If you just leave it without any kind of touch, it'll dry up. So right now, I'm happy for them to be in the, the big structures, to be in the museums, to spark those conversations. But it, uh, it is um, tough, you know? There, there aren't just easy solutions, you know? Artists are often suggesting things to all of us that are pushing us. So I think the idea of bringing um, a work like Dianita's into our museum um, has you know, raised questions for us about how to 
include how to use the stools and furniture. We have so many visitors in this museum, how it lives here. There are certain kinds of conversations that can be around this museum here at the Museum of Modern Art that would be a very different kind of conversation when the same images go out into the world in the book form. So um, hopefully there's many different kinds of fruitful new ideas that come mm -hmm. from those tensions, but there are certainly tensions that arise with all great work. I think that's the case. How does MoMA feel about the idea of touching it versus, versus <laughs> preserving it? Right. I mean, not everyone is touching ours when they go into the museum since we've now acquired it. So thank, thankfully, Dianita has made these other ways for them to get involved um, with the tactile experience of the images, as she has with so many of her works through her books. Um, but having those conversations, periodic conversations, was something really important to us. And there are just so many different stories and different strands to this work that it's so great to have the opportunity to bring out. So, um, for example, house museums is something that Dianita just mentioned. We're going to have a talk about house museums in the structure using the table and stools later this month. Um, and other things like that. There's hopefully many more conversations to come. Um, but it's something that we have to think about all the time now that it's here, I think. Yeah, conversations are really important in a museum, no? Um, and it was in, in, uh, at the Kiranadar Museum in Delhi. I was so desperate for people to come because I used to go there every day to try and, with my great assistant Simrat, try and move it, make new combinations, bring images from File Museum into the Little Ladies Museum. But nobody was really coming to the museum. It's, it's quite the opposite of what you have at MoMA. So I used to do, so one time I did a book release, then I did, um, I made an award for the chief archivist of India and invited my uncle Austin Sufi for that. Um, I would have a conference on uh, artists working with museums. I once turned the entire Museum of Chance into a library and made different tables. And there was one table of Robert Frank's books. There was one table of Emmett Gowan's books. There was another table of Adam Fuss's books. And just like a very, very precise, just this great desire for the museum space to be used. And even if somebody wanted to rent it for their birthday party, that would be fine by me. Just as long as people would come to the museum, because I do believe that, you know, there's a lot that one gets from spending time in the museum, but why is it that more people don't come? I know it's the opposite problem here, <laughs> but in India, if you get 500 visitors a day, that's huge in a museum. And it shouldn't be like that. We are lucky here, as are others that get to experience this in this way. Are there other questions from the audience? Oh, yes. Yeah, um, as I heard you talk about your, your conception of museums, and particularly uh, the Museum of Chance, um, what I was hearing was as much about language, space, physical shapes, and, and actually human habitation humans moving through and engaging with each other in that space as the museum was about images. So I started thinking, is it possible to imagine making a museum um, along the lines that you've conceptualized that includes images in conception, but not in fact? So you have your museum, you, you're, you're talking about Basically, you're talking about sculpture, you're talking about architecture, you're talking about movement, you're talking about conversation, you're talking about sitting and standing, and then you said you didn't want it to be just about pho photographs. Um, so I started thinking, is it possible to have all of that where images are actually part of the conception but not necessarily there as static photographs? So, and that, I, and you've that, done that. That, mm -hmm. I, that's, that's what I did at the end of the Kiranadar Museum in the last week. I started removing the images. And in the last days, the museums were completely empty. And at that time, uh, for me, it was a very, it was also quite overwhelming because there was still the residue of the images. And I tried to propose it to a few people that that's how it should be shown. And, but if, you know, it's like, 
what can I do? Everybody wants to see the photographs. And I said, just, just let the museum be. And it's still very photographic, because anyone who knows the slightest about analog photography would know that this is 120 six by six format, and this is 35 mm for format. So you know that it's photographic. It's not just for pieces of textiles. Um, and maybe someday that'll happen. But sometimes I do show the main structure empty, and then the images, and you could do that at MoMA too, where the structure is empty, and the images are in the boxes on the wall. So that sort of then becomes a compromise. But I haven't yet been able to show all of it empty, uh, other than at the end of the show when I do it myself. We could try doing that here. <laughs> Take a few images out every day. When you see Dianita's images, it's very hard to say goodbye to them. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes. And I, I know others have had that issue. And actually, if I may, because we have some other, just a couple of other images um, here to talk about some of the stories and images that have come into this museum, because while it is very much about the structure and what it can be and what a museum is, it also does uh, consist of 162 images, including many images of figures that have been so important to you across your career, family members, um, and others such as Mona. And this is a picture of Mona Ahmed, who was the subject of your second book. And there are pictures from that time that you made of Mona. And then there are pictures that you made over many years of Mona, including ones like this, where Mona has revisited her old picture and is pictured there in front of a projection of that image. So you see her silhouetted against herself in the graveyard where she lived. And in fact, there's this opportunity to um, tell stories of individual lives, drawing them out of this museum as well, I think, and Mona is one of them. Um, so there's this opportunity to tell these multi-layered portraits within this. Yeah, tomorrow yeah. when we speak at length about the museum, I think we have at least a dozen biographies going on in that museum, because that's just also the way I work. Uh, my young friend here that I've been photographing now for 25 years, no? <laughs> so it, it, I think once one starts, you don't, often I, I just don't stop. So I'm still photographing Zakir and I photographed Mona till she passed away two years ago. But she's still sort of montaging her way into my images. So someone like Mona just never goes away and you know, when, Mona is, a, is someone I met over 30 years ago and is, was a eunuch, but was always outside of the eunuch community as well. She was just ve a very unique person. And I think she, I have learned a lot from her. She, she really just lived life on her terms and she moved away from the eunuchs and started to live in a graveyard and had a sort of intelligence that I always thought she had a secret life, that she was a scholar, that I didn't quite know about. There was something about her that I didn't know. Um, but she became a huge influence in my life. And her, her way of looking at things became, I think Zakir has been a mentor, but Mona has also been a mentor. She, she had such a different, a unique way of looking at life, a unique way of looking at everything. And so there's a lot of her in Museum of Chance. And there's a lot of... Uh, there are, there's actually a museum, the Museum of Machines exists on its own, but there are many um, machines or other apparatuses, <laughs> apparati, in this museum as well those that um, might have been in use at particularly uh, significant moments in the past, such as this one. Do you want to tell the story of this? Yeah, this is, this is a camera of Satyajit Ray that I had photographed many, many years ago. And they say this is what he shot Pathir Panchali on. 
And then at the opening, I was just uh, saying this to Ratan and Lucy, that this is Satyajit Ray's camera. And then Ratan said, oh, but tomorrow we are actually showing Potter Ponchali. And that was such an amazing coincidence. And then Glenn told us that uh, the premiere of Pater Ponchali was at MoMA in 1955. So it's, it's the, that element of chance continues even while the museum is installed here. And I'm sure tomorrow when Roxana and Sarah very kindly building new museums <laughs> with with these boxes of prints and these models. Um, we'll have other surprises. It's, I know that this Museum of Chance is just sort of loaded with so much possibility that I think for many, many, many decades, curators won't tire of finding new stories in them, new connections. I'm sure of it. Are there additional questions from the audience? In fact, um, this phrase <laughs> that you've brought into the museum, I think points to that possibility by including uh, text. And in fact, there are several stills from films and other text pieces um, that are some of the fragments that make up the Museum of Chance. But this is just one of those images that I think functions in the same way that some of the uh, staircases, beckoning staircases, or particular views into buildings, they draw us forward into the story. So when we see a narrative of images created and one image appearing after the other in the structure, we start to see the chain of events that happened with chance. And I think that that was something that you've talked about with this particular phrase as well. Yeah. At one time, this was going to be the, ti the title of the work. What happened is this. Um, museum of Chance was actually, it was the longest museum for me to give birth to as well, because it took me two years to come to that edit of images. So the museums is not just the structure, and uh, it's, it was so, so difficult to find the set of images where Literally, uh, tomorrow you'll see Roxana might pull out this image. And then almost randomly, if she pulls this out, there should be a connection between them, that they should work. That if a curator decides to show just two boxes, um, that they would somehow still connect. And so that took the longest time for Museum of Chance, other than creating this new kind of structure, very different from my other museums, was to get the edit just right. And there were sort of certain words, like what happened is this, that became tools with which I edited. Yeah, tools is a great word, I think. And so Dianita keeps mentioning tomorrow, and I will say that tomorrow at noon, we, Dianita is thankfully here from Delhi, so we're very grateful that she can be in residence uh, in her museum tomorrow. But this is one of these opportunities where we can be in the gallery and uh, be in the work itself. Um, and there will be more. Check our website for additional conversations. Um, and also, the galleries are open. So this is this great chance where we are here um, in the theater talking about a work, and the museum is still open and we can see the work um, right now, should we wish. Should I'm we very into happy the to give you a guided tour. <laughs> so I am going upstairs, and if any of you haven't seen the museum would like to come, please come. Otherwise, I'm happy to sit there and <laughs> contemplate on chance. Thank you so much for coming, and thank you, Dianita. Thank you, Lucy. Thank you.